session here of this uh, wonderful forum and we're especially uh, pleased with the embarrassment of riches we have here at the Kennedy School this afternoon. These, these seats are still warm from the last forum, uh, <laughs> which only broke up about 15 minutes ago uh, and had a, had a good crowd. Uh, but as you know, the, uh, the Kennedy School is uh, particularly grateful this week that the Interaction Council is meeting here. That's a group of former heads of government who have banded together. They come together uh, uh, each year to consider serious world issues, and there, there are five of them here. Uh, in, uh, uh, at the Kennedy School today. Uh, four of them will be joining us on stage here uh, very shortly. Uh, this is also a day when the Dean's Council is gathering here at the Kennedy School. There are several members uh, of the very distinguished from both from the United States and from overseas. They'll be meeting with a, uh, there'll be a dinner tonight and then they'll be, they'll be meeting with the Dean tomorrow. They're an important source of uh, wisdom for us here at the school. Uh, and uh, we, are, uh, we also have George Soros uh, with us, uh, who is uh, blessing us with this forum, and we have all of you. So we thank you for coming. This is a terrific day. Let me tell you a little bit about how we're going to proceed. Uh, um, we're going to have a conversation here uh, uh, with these two gentlemen first uh, to talk about their new books. Each has written a new book that has been uh, uh, well received, and we want, we want a chance to introduce the books and the ideas behind the books because they're very timely, especially in, in the events of the last uh, few months. Uh, then we're going to, and that will last for perhaps 30 minutes, then we're going to ask the uh, former heads of, uh, of government who are here to uh, join us, or four of the five who are here in the audience. Um, and after we've had a chance to, they've had a chance to respond to some of the conversation they've already heard, uh, then we will turn to you all in the audience and try to have another 30 minutes at least uh, with that. And I know that, that this session last year was, was uh, as Bill White said, it was magical. There were two, uh, Malcolm Fraser from Australia and Kim Campbell from Canada were here last year among those on the panel and they are, they're back uh, 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 on a, um, for an encore. Uh, so they'll be joining us in a short while. But now to the gentleman on my left and then the gentleman on my right. Uh, each needs very little introduction, certainly, uh, to this crowd. George Soros has just written a book, George Soros on Globalization. Uh, as you know, he has a uh, distinguished uh, record. I can, I can read a bit of this uh, that they have provided me. He's chairman of the Soros Fund Management, as well as the founder of a global network of foundations dedicated to supporting open societies. Now, please listen to this. This is a gentleman who went out had a, had, a, had the golden touch in the financial markets and might have lived a life of ease. But he is determined to try to change the world and he's been taking his money and putting it behind his ideas. In each of the last five years, in each of the last five years, he has provided some $425 million in foreign assistance on his own through his foundations for the promotion of op open societies around the world. So I think that you get some sense of how 
dedicated he is to the propositions he's talking about tonight. Um, George Soros uh, uh, grew up in uh, Budapest. Uh, he survived the Nazis. He left Hungary in 1947 for England, went to the London School of Economics. While a student at LSE, uh, he became familiar with the work of the philosopher Karl Popper. And as, as many of you know, that's where he began developing his own ideas about uh, uh, the open society. He's written several other books, but we're delighted to have him here to discuss this book tonight. Now, on my right, as all of you know, is the dean of the school, uh, who has uh, served not only uh, in, in Washington in distinguished posts, but has also served at this university in a variety of distinguished posts. Uh, he has uh, uh, written several books which have had a major impact. One, on I, I remember when I first got to read Joe Nye's book, was Bound to Lead, it was back in 1990, and he's had another book that had a lot of impact on governance in a globalizing world. And his most recent book, which has come out through Oxford Press, which I commend to you along with the George Soros book, is The Paradox of American Power, The Paradox of American Power. And uh, it, it's been interesting in international forums over the last few months. Not only has the book been uh, come out to acclaim, but at the World Economic Forum, and which was held in New York this, this uh, year, as you know, um, this was the book that was distributed to everybody who came to the, individual copies of the book were distributed to everybody who came to that forum was as, as uh, to invite the conversation and the, uh, uh, the Trilateral Commission, which just met in Washington two or three weeks ago, this book was at the center of conversation there uh, as well. So, gentlemen, we're delighted to have you both here. Uh, thank you for joining us. And perhaps we could start with you, George Soros. It's interesting you made up reading the books, as I mentioned to you just before we came out. What struck me uh, was that each of you came from a different place analytically, and yet you wound up in much the same place at the end of your analysis. So tell us about when you wrote Globalization, why you wanted to take on that subject. A lot have been written about it, but you have a special take. I'm curious. Well, what to it. you know, uh, uh, being a participant in global financial markets, I felt that I have a certain insight. Uh, and of course, I have uh, certain ideas about the uh, global open society. And in my view, uh, the global capitalist system that prevails today is a kind of a distorted form of a global open society. Uh, and uh, it has deficiencies, uh, is being attacked uh, by uh, the international institutions are being attacked uh, for those deficiencies. And my argument is that instead of attacking them, we ought to strengthen them, reform them, uh, and uh, make that transition uh, from a uh, global capitalist system to a uh, global open society. Mm -hmm. so that was and the, you make the argument in the book there's a, an, almost an unholy alliance against the existing uh, uh, organizations such as the World Bank, the IMF, uh, that's coming from the anti-globalists on the left, from what you call the market fundamentalists on the right. That's, that's right. And it is, it is unfortunately, a, a, a strong coalition that has has, in fact, uh, had a, a big impact. And I would like to see a, a different coalition uh, uh, formed. And I think there, is, uh, there are grounds for it. In other words, it's not an impossible uh, objective. But your argument is that instead of giving, having something people can be against, there needs to be some proposals out there that they can be for. And that's what you're putting forward. Tell us what the proposal is you're putting forward as something people could be for. Uh, well, uh, uh, it is very much more difficult to give open society a meaning, which is a positive meaning. It's, e it's easier to fight against a, a, an enemy. Uh, and so we, we actually have to realize that we have common interests as inhabitants of this globe, as mem members of this globalized uh, uh, society. Uh, so uh, I went through the various institutions that we currently have. I examined them, uh, pointed out what, um, uh, how they could be improved. I mean, I don't have a magic bullet. In other words, I don't have one sort of thing that's going to uh, change it all. But I did then expand on a, on a particular proposal, uh, which is a little bit complicated, uh, but I think it goes to the heart of the matter. 
and that is, uh, if you're familiar with the special drawing rights at the, the Interna International uh, Monetary Fund uh, can issue. Uh, this is a, a form of uh, reserve uh, currency. And I propose uh, this would be very valuable to the less developed countries that suffer from a, sh a shortage of currency uh, reserves and have to pay very heavily to, pre to, uh, to um, uh, build up their reserves. So this would give them direct uh, relief. The, the developed countries don't need these additional reserves because they can go to the market. It has no particular benefit to them. And so I propose that they should uh, uh, donate their allocations for international assistance. And that would allow us to provide more assistance and also to provide it better. Now, let me be sure, because I, I, had, I had a hard time getting my head around this. Yeah, yeah, the that's idea right. SD, hey, SDRs, uh, the special drawing rights. Uh, as Bob Hormatz, he, he, he educates me periodically, he said this is like paper gold. And, and it's a transfer from the donor countries, from the richer countries, these special drawing rights to the, the developing countries or less no, developed. No, no, no. There's no transfer. Special, no, no. Uh, Who pays? Forget, for the moment, for the moment, forget about the transfer. That's the second, second element. Yeah. The special drawing rights are issued by the, the International Monetary Fund. Who pays for them? Uh, it's, it's, um, it's available. The, 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 the countries that use it have to pay for it. Uh, but if they don't use it, they don't have to pay for it. Now, the, you need reserves that you don't use. You need to, uh, to show, in order to be good for, for business, in other words, to carry on business, you need to have a certain relationship between your reserves and the amount of international trade you do. As a, as a minimum, you have to have reserves equal to three months imports. Okay? Now, if you get this allocation, that, that constitutes reserves. Who's good for it? And the, any, any, any other member, any, any car, you can exchange it into any currency. No, 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 you can no, exchange no. it into dollars. Yeah. It's, it's money created, effectively. Uh, reserves created by the IMF. You, you haven't got some of this available at the Kennedy School, have you? <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could use some SDRs around here. The, uh, the, uh, uh, what, what I don't understand is somebody's got to, you don't create money just out of the, uh, out of the lecture. I mean, this, this would be great. Be like, you could be the alchemist of our time. Yeah. The, the, but you, somebody has got to pay for these SDRs. Think of it. Think of it. As a credit line. Yeah. Let's say that okay. you, you know, somebody's got to be the creditor. Uh, uh, the, let's say that you you get you get a credit okay. line from the from the bank. All right? right. You don't have to pay for it, okay. but it means that you're good for it for that you have that credit. That's a that's a benefit to you. Now, when you actually use that credit, then you have to pay interest. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is the same with the user of SDRs. Okay. The interest you pay is, is the, actually the, uh, the, the combined treasury bill rates of the, uh, of the main, main countries that, right. uh, whose currencies you use. So it's very cheap when you use it. Right. See, I take it's it like uh, having, as I say, a credit card where you don't pay 18%, but you right. pay 25 I take it one of the main advantages is you do not have to go to the Congress to get an appropriation every year. For this, you don't. But uh -huh. once you donate it, but once mentioned. you donate it, you actually do have to get an appropriation okay. because, so the the uh, less developed countries get this credit line. That is a, a direct benefit for for them, which is very much needed in today's world when when actually there is a shortage of capital flowing to the developed world. Right. So, uh, but then the, the rich countries donate it. When they donate it, they have to go to, because it is a, actually a res, uh, a resource transfer. So that would require approval from Congress. I see, all right. Now let me ask you one last question, because it's where it, yeah. we zone more easily into where, where Joe and I is coming from. In other words, there is no yeah. free lunch, except <laughs> it's about as close you, get, you can get to it. It's free if you don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I think they will. <laughs> the uh, 
you make a, a, a in your concluding chapter, both of you actually started writing before September 11th and then wrote concluding chapters after September 11th. And September 11th is woven through your analysis. Uh, you write about the United States and its obligation in this area, and indeed the, the, the rich donor countries or richer countries. And you say that with regard to the United States foreign policy, that there's always been a tension between what you call geopolitical realism and open society idealism. But you go on to say that moral responsibilities, moral responsibilities, that is the missing element from, the American far, from America's foreign policy. Elaborate on that, if you would. Uh, my argument is that the United States is the dominant power in the, in the world today. Dominant economically, dominant financially, and as we have seen in our intervention in Afghanistan, also dominant uh, militarily. Uh, no, no other uh, state or, or combination of states can really endanger uh, our uh, secu security. And uh, we are in charge of the system. We can't do anything we want, as we are finding out uh, when we are trying it now. Uh, but really, nothing can happen without our consent. So we set the terms of, 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 the, of the debate about what the system should be like. And we ought to be cognizant of our, of our dominant position, be concerned about how the system works, be more concerned than we currently are. That is really the, the, the main thrust of my argument. That in order to, to maintain our, our dominance, uh, we have to ensure that it benefits the world. And unfortunately, we are currently embarked on a different course. We have a, we have a, a government which has a different vision. It wants to enhance the unilateral uh, 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 strength of the United States with missile defense and, and, and in every uh, direction. And that, I say, is more utopian than my proposal of a global open society. In other words, it's less sustainable than a global open society. Chonai, that's... <clears throat> That analysis comes fairly close to yours. Yes, uh, George and I do come out uh, pretty much the same place. And uh, the reason I called my book The Paradox of American Power is that the United States is the strongest country compared to other countries since Rome. And yet we can't get the things we want in the world by acting alone. So the subtitle of the book is Why the World's Only Superpower Can't Go It Alone. But just take the events of September 11th and the threat of terrorism. Um, many people think that uh, sending the military into Afghanistan solved the problem. It solved about one quarter of the problem, and it did that quite well. But if Al-Qaeda is a network with uh, cells in some 50 countries, the only way you're really going to be able to defeat Al-Qaeda is by close civilian cooperation, uh, intelligence sharing, police work, uh, tracing financial flows and so forth. So the view that, uh, that we can, because we're the strongest country, that we can handle these things alone is, is extremely misleading. And uh, to the extent that we act arrogantly because we believe that we can handle it alone, we actually undercut one of the great sources of our strength, which is what I call our soft power, our ability to attract others to do what we want. And it's only when we stand for certain ideals, such as George mentioned, and follow policies which include the interests of others and consult others, that you can actually use that soft power. So though we come at different ends, George starts more on the economics, I start more on the politics, we actually come out uh, fairly close yeah. in the conclusions. You write a lot about how uh, a nations can squander their soft power by acting arrogantly, and you, that word arrogance runs through a lot of the book, and that's obviously a fear on your part. Is there also a way that you build up your soft power uh, by, by acting in the way, in other words, if you invest in foreign assistance, do you build up your soft power? Yes, in fact, uh, to uh, give President Bush credit, uh, 
in when he announced a 50 percent increase in our development assistance over the next uh, three years, that was a way to align our policies with the aspirations of that half of the world that's living under $2 a day. Uh, obviously, we're not going to solve that in that amount of time, and also I'd like to see more than we're doing. But we have to make sure that we show that we're interested in the aspirations of the rest of the world. And when the rest of the world is living under $2 a day, uh, you have to take that seriously. Uh, two questions on that. Uh, Joe, I, I've been curious on how you make your own calculations on this. The United States does spend over $300 billion a year on, on defense, and what some tend to now up to $15 billion a year on, 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 on foreign assistance. Some of that money we spend on defense is, well, most of that money is obviously for our own benefit, but some of it also does preserve world order to a degree. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, do, do we get something to more? Uh, do we have to be, meet, the, meet the same standards as everybody else on foreign assistance, too, or are Americans entitled to feel, wait a minute, we pay a lot of money for the common defense. Isn't, shouldn't that be taken into account on thinking how much we ought to be doing on foreign assistance? Well, it's a little bit hard to sort out uh, uh, how much of it's for our interest, how much is for others. Part of the reason for that is that we should be following interests which include the interests of others. Mm -hmm. To the extent that, uh, for example, 100,000 American troops in East Asia stabilize the region, reduce the incentives for conflict or arms races between China and Japan and so forth, that's good for China and Japan, as well as Korea and other countries in the region. So we should get some credit of creating a public good of regional stability there. But that's not quite the picture you'll get in Africa, where they might say, we don't see what this American military expenditure is doing for us uh, that's beneficial. And I think in in that sense, uh, we really do have an obligation to do more in terms of uh, dealing with AIDS, dealing with the, the problems of debt relief, uh, dealing with the basic problems of, of development in Africa. So it's, I don't see it as either or. In fact, if you look at American uh, budget, uh, we spend uh, about 17 times as much on our military power as we spend on the State Department, all development assistance, uh, the Voice of America, take all those other things and wrap them up together, and it's one-seventeenth of what we spend on the military alone. Uh, I think you need both hard and soft power. You've got to walk on two legs, but it's odd when one leg is 17 times shorter than the other. <laughs> George Soros has talked about a need for moral responsibility in our foreign policy. Can the two of you tell me how much you think would be sufficient? I mean, the president has increased the foreign assistance budget from 10 to 15. George Soros himself says a lot of foreign aid doesn't work the way it's been allocated. So if we're really talking about, OK, if we're going to meet our moral responsibility, what is it that would meet the res our moral responsibility in the world, and how would you change it? so that it works more effectively? Well, there have been uh, goals set of 7 tenths of 1% right. uh, of GNP for, for aid. I think actually those goals uh, are probably not the right way to think about it. The key question is to think, how can you get money to poor people in poor countries? Just pouring money into the countries may be enriching Switzerland. Uh, what we have to do is think much harder about development mechanisms. For example, when you get the price of drugs in Africa down, market systems can help Africans get hold of those drugs, and it's much harder to skim the cream and send it off in corruption. Uh, there are ways in which you can use NGOs and nonprofit organizations for delivery systems, and rather than always working through governments. There are ways in which you can set up criteria where governments which have shown that they're effective on education or public health and so forth get an extra help with assistance and governments which haven't don't get it. So I think one of the things we're trying to do with the Center for National Development here at the Kennedy School is think harder not just about what's the absolute magnitude, but how do we get better delivery systems so that the assistance actually gets to poor people in poor countries. And that's something you've been concerned about. Yeah. Well, You're going uh, through your foundations trying yeah, to figure I, that out. Actually, I am in that business, right. you know, with, with my foundations. And uh, you mentioned the disparity between the defense budget and, and aid and other uh, uh, diplomatic efforts. 
uh, I see it as the aid going into prevention of conflicts. And then the military comes in when you haven't succeeded, and in fact, you have to intervene. So you need both. Uh, I think if you if you only uh, did one, uh, you you would uh, come up short. So I am very glad that we have that military superiority that we have. But we are not paying enough attention to the prevention. Now, my uh, my entire effort with the foundations has been can be described as prevention because we uh, we are trying to build open societies in the countries where we operate. And that is the best way. It's not, of course, a, a perfect way, but it, it can go a long way in preventing uh, 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 things going to a, to a, coming to a bad end. And the amounts involved that you need are much, much less, and the pain is much less when you are engaged in, in uh, prevention. Right. Let me ask you about this before we bring in our next uh, group up. How does your, um, it, it, every day one reads it, opens the paper today and, and the world just seems out of joint. Things are just moving in ways that are very distressing to all of us. How does your analysis apply now to what's going on in the Middle East with the war on terrorism right there simultaneously in our consciousness. The, the administration, and Graham Allison could talk more about this than I can, but the administration is concerned that Saddam may get a, have nuclear capability very quickly, and yet it's got this problem in the Middle East, and how you know, they'd like to move as quickly as possible. How does your analysis apply to how we ought to move now? Go. Well, I think we have to, the United States has to be more active uh, on the Middle East. Uh, I, don't, I think the leadership on both sides has gotten into a morass where they can't get out of it on their own. I think we have to come up with more of a settlement, a proposal for a settlement, not merely confidence building measures or ceasefires which will be broken, but actually put on the table something which looks like a significant Palestinian state and security for Israel. And I think the United States has to take that much more. That's so, our next big step, you think? I think? I think so. I don't think you can say tenant plan, Mitchell plan, step by step anymore. I think that uh, the administration waited for this situation to ripen before they got involved. Instead of that, it got rotten. And I think we now have to realize <laughs> well, that's that. That's a good line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have to realize that, it, that it's going to take much more action than, right. than was appropriate a, a year ago. And I frankly don't, I think it would be a grave mistake to try to move on Iraq uh, while two things are happening. One is while you have this problem in the Israel-Palestine relationship, and also while you still have the Al-Qaeda network out there creating a clear and present danger. Uh, that, uh, those two things ought to come first. Uh, at some point, if I were convinced Saddam Hussein was developing nuclear weapons, and I'd put inspectors back in and he didn't uh, allow them to go where they were, frankly, I think before I would have let a country that had violated its multilateral obligations, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and it violated UN inspection systems, and supported terrorism in the past, before I'd let that country develop nuclear weapons, I would consider the use of force. But I would take a series of steps first to make it clear that he was violating his multilateral obligations. And so I would essentially focus my efforts now on the Israel-Palestine issue, wrapping up al-Qaeda, and laying the case through inspections about whether Saddam was, in fact, uh, violating it. If you got back to a negotiating table, and if is a big question here, on the Middle East, inevitably that negotiation will take a while. And you were sitting in the Defense Department, or you were sitting there with, as the intelligence analyst as you were, and thought that uh, Saddam was about to have a nuclear capability. Would you go ahead and move without, con you know, would you, would you feel like you had to go ahead and move without waiting necessarily to get everything as, into perfect order? At some point, if you felt that Saddam was going to get nuclear weapons, knowing that his delivery system is not going to be rockets but terrorists, I think I would move. But I think the chances that we have of a couple of years to work on this are, are I mean, every 
thing I've learned, we have not, he's not just about to get nuclear mm -hmm. weapons. We do have time to do things, these things in the sequence that I described. But if in extremists that were the case, I think I would. Hmm. Hmm. And how, how does your own analysis, well, let, let you've worked me, on this in Central yeah, Europe. On, no, on let, me, let me, if, if I may, uh, address the same two mm. questions. Because Please. finally, I have something where we, we, we differ. Disagree. So, <laughs> so that gives us something at yeah. least that, uh, you see, I, I do think that Saddam represents a clear and present danger. And we actually can't wait for perfect con conditions. So I think uh, uh, if we could, we should deal with Saddam. I think the way we are going about it is the wrong way, because we want to do it unilaterally through dictation that we have chosen him as our enemy and, and, and we are going to deal with him. I think we have to have a more legitimate cause. Uh, what, uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, particularly biological weapons, now represent a very serious danger. So they need to be banned. So there has to be a mechanism for inspection which has to be intrusive. And it, it, it can be enforced uh, also in, on countries that don't agree to it. So it is not necessarily something that requires a United Nations uh, 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 kind of approval. It can be an alliance of the willing who say, we are threatened, we cooperate, we impose certain conditions, we insist on unconditional uh, uh, inspection. No, but it has to apply universally. It has to apply not only to Saddam, but to us, for, for, for that matter, or for any, to any other country. So, uh, uh, if, we ha if we did that, I think we could then have a, a coalition which, which uh, either would be able to assure that there are no weapons of mass destruction or, in fact, w would be able to attack uh, 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 Iraq. So uh, if we need international cooperation. We need uh, uh, international rules that apply to us as they apply uh, uh, to, to, uh, to others. Now, you also asked about I I Israel. And I think that is a terrifying example of what is ahead of us if we just s simply want to wage war on terrorism. Because basically, Israel has been waging war on terrorism now for, for 50 years. They have tr there's been a valiant attempt to, to make peace. Uh, really, the, I'm thinking particularly of the, the Oslo Initiative. That was really a very a, a courageous, and, and it was on the verge of success, to the point where Rabin had to be killed by extremists to stop it. Right now. We have to recognize, or the Israelis have to recognize, that the Palestinians have legitimate uh, grievances, and they have to address them. The sooner you do it, the less it deteriorates into what is now a sort of a, a, a self-reinforcing process of victims uh, turning perpetrators, uh, creating new victims, uh, creating uh, uh, new perpetrators and escalating uh, this, uh, the, this process. So what about a Joe Nye plan? Uh, uh, have an American plan out there that would be well, I think a we'll, final plan, put it on the table soon. Well, I think actually the, 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 the outlines of, of, the, of the settlement are, no, no, no. are really very clear. I mean, they've been clear for a long, for a long time. It's, you have to have an Israeli state that is recognized by the Arabs. And you have to have a, a Palestinian state, uh, which gives uh, a home to the Palestinians. It means that the, the refugees can't return to Israel. They can return to, to Palestine. And you, now you need to have clearly uh, 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 marked borders, which are also now defensible because the tensions are so great that you, you, you can't sort of have free intercourse, so you have to have the moment separation. So it's, it is, uh, this is there. There are elements on both sides uh, that are opposed to it. 
And in the case of Israel, I think it's in the government that you have got those elements. So that is the obstacle that needs to be overcome. And uh, I think this is what the United States ought to stand for. Would that include U.S. troops on the ground? I, I certainly wouldn't want to see U.S. troops on the ground alone there, because I think we would become targets and hostages, a little bit like the Marines were in Beirut. I think you probably at some stage would need a multilateral force. Uh, what role the U.S. would play in that, I think, uh, would probably have to be a part, but not solely U.S. troops. Why don't we invite our other, uh, uh, our former heads of government to join us if we could. There, there are four chairs here. I'm not sure of the order. It'll take a moment to be lavaliered, uh, so to speak. Uh, we, there's one other former head of government, Jamil Mawad, who's over here from Ecuador, who has been here on the stage many times uh, and is uh, 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 graciously going to stay there so we can get these four on the, he is? Uh, on the stage tonight. And so while they're, they're being... Uh, Lavalier, can we, can we, we, why don't I go ahead and make the introductions so we can move, if we can, seamlessly uh, through this. Uh, all of you know Kim Campbell, uh, who is the, uh, for, who is here, visiting professor here at practice at the Kennedy School, and has had rave reviews uh, as a teacher. We've been just excited that she's been associated with the Center for Public Leadership, and, uh, and she's, uh, we understand now why, why she became the, uh, first woman uh, defense minister and then the first woman prime minister uh, of Canada. Uh, she is, uh, has held many portfolios. I will tell you now that she's uh, also the chair of the Council of Women World Leaders, uh, which is based here at the Kennedy School. And as I think most of you know, uh, Laura Liswood is here, uh, that the membership consists of women who have hold or have held the offices of president or prime minister in their own country. And we're proud to say that that's a growing list. Um, and she's and Kim has been extremely helpful to us too. We have a we have a seminar that's coming up this uh, this May on women and leadership. We've got uh, 40 to 50 women coming to the Kennedy School for a week, and Kim Campbell's been right at the center of organized. First time we've tried that at the Kennedy School, and we hope to make it a, a regular feature. And she's been instrumental in pulling it up together. Uh, so to uh, her, uh, her left is uh, is, is uh, Andres van Acht. And who is, uh, was the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of the Netherlands from 1977 to 1982. He's an attorney. He's a former professor of criminal law. He's also served as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Justice. He served as the European Community Ambassador to Japan, as the EC Ambassador of the United States, and as Chairman of the Interaction Council from 1995 to 1997. On our uh, far right, is a Carl, uh, my far right, Carl Fergler, who served as president of the Swiss Confederation in 1977, 1981, 1985. Was that three different elections that, that you won? Or were those? It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, he was a practicing lawyer for a number of years before he went straight, went into politics. Uh, then he became a member of parliament. He was leader of the Christian Democratic Party group, head of the Federal Department of Public Economy, and has been president of the Swiss National Olympic Committee since 1988. That's the post that you still hold, sir. Is that correct? The last sentence wouldn't be absolutely correct. I'm a member of honor of the IOC, but the chairman of the National Olympic Committee, I'm not. All right. But you've been deeply involved in the Olympics. No bluff at all, here in Harvard especially. So <laughs> it's quite clear. <laughs> and uh, many of you have met uh, uh, Malcolm Fraser, who was a Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia from 1975 until 1983. He's also served as a Member of Parliament, Minister for the Army, Minister for <laughs> Education and Science, and Minister for Defense, many portfolios. He is also Chairman of the Interaction Council, uh, and the Council's meetings uh, today and tomorrow are on the subject, quote, international humanitarian law, humanitarian crises, and military intervention. Michael Ignatieff, Ignatieff helped to kick off the conversation today, and they've been going uh, merrily since. So welcome, one and all. Uh, now, uh, first question out, I, if you would, please. You all had a chance to hear George Soros and Joe Nye talk about uh, the general topic of the paradoxes of globalization. I'm curious about your response and your own thoughts on some of the subjects raised. Kim Campbell. Well, it's interesting because <clears throat> there's a similarity in themes when George Soros talks about the need for a moral dimension in foreign policy. 
And the concept of soft power really is, is a, the power of moral suasion that is sometimes exercised through institutions, but comes from the stature that a country has in the international arena. And it's interesting, one of the things about getting older, as I discover as I get older, is that uh, aside from the fact that sometimes there's progress in things that uh, had discouraged you before, the things that discourage you now, you, you realize were not always the case. And what, I, what concerns me is that when we talk about morality in American politics, uh, the, there seems to be a growing tendency to see it in terms of religion. And the sort of, the sort of theological concept of morality when I was a young woman, I'm a product, a child of the 60s, when one talked about the morality and policy, one talked more about the constitutional concepts, the values in the American Bill of Rights. It was a non-theological, non-religious conception, and yet a very powerful and persuasive moral code for American policy. Uh, the writer, uh, Ed Doctorow, Yale Doctorow, who wrote Ragtime, gave a talk a couple of years ago I heard called The Politics of God. And he talked about this change he felt in American government and politics and the growing force of religion. And he used a wonderful expression. He said, uh, doubt is a great civilizer. And I think that what I see in the growing sort of religiosity of American policy, which is not the same as morality, uh, we look, for example, at uh, the policy with respect to the population growth. We now know that contrary to our expectations, women in the third world, even women who are not uh, well-educated, are learning what the mechanisms are of limita limiting their their reproduction, spacing their children, doing the things that they all want to do to give their children the best uh, opportunities. And yet American policy does not support institutions that would make it, or policy that would make it possible for them to do that. So I think, and speaking as a foreigner, speaking as a Canadian who, uh, I mean, and Canadians are, you know, are not just unarmed Americans with health insurance. I mean, it's quite a, <laughs> it's quite a different society. And one of the differences is, a, is, is the much less religious concept of public morality. And what concerns me is that what this leads to is a, 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 a morality that's religious, that's judgmental, and that in many ways, uh, I think, limits the capacity of the United States to build its soft power because the values of the Constitution, the values of liberty, of free speech, of democracy, uh, a freedom of, 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 of assembly, all of these things are a powerful, powerful message to other countries. And what I see is, is that very often when people look at American foreign policy, they see it as being very hypocritical. It's interesting. We look at the Middle East. We look what's happening with Israel, the Palestinians down. It's very distressing. And yet for many people outside the United States or outside of North America, they look at the United States and its war against terrorism, and they see it in very much the same way. They, they, they see kind of a, a pox on both houses. So I think this question of what, are the, what is the morality that will uh, animate or enlighten American foreign policy, and how will Americans articulate a sense of values that really will strengthen their soft power? When I was a student many years ago, there was a, somebody wrote an article during the Vietnam War, Why Big Nations Lose Small Wars. Hmm. And the, the, what Joe's talked about, the paradox of American power, is, is, is such a powerful idea and an important one. So I think this is really a challenge that we face. What is the morality that will make Americans, America's influence what Americans and the rest of the world would like it to be? Question, Kim, follow up. Soft power, this concept of soft power. Uh, it, it strikes me that Canada is a nation that has learned to use soft power very well, sort of one of the world's good guys. Uh, if you would. And, I just think uh, we use hard power too, but you never write about it. We have 2,500 <laughs> troops in Afghanistan, but you'd never know we were there. But, uh, but yes, because we don't, we're not big enough to be. Uh, but that, and that, and that women have learned to use soft power as leaders mm. because they've had to. And, and that, that has yeah. been a, an asset for them in personal leadership. Yeah. Can I give, is that, you know, that's a really interesting point because there's a lot of very interesting work. As you know, I teach a course on gender and power, and there's a lot of interesting work on gendered styles of leadership, gendered styles of discourse. And what most scholars would say is that the kind of interactive, consensual style of leadership that women have developed is really a reflection of, of being disempowered. But it is intrinsically valuable, and the best analogy I can give it is to compare it to in music, to classical music and jazz. African American musicians for most of the 20th century were not permitted in the concert halls. So people like Fats Waller, who had phenomenal musical technique and could have played any of the, you know, Brahms, Beethoven, Bach, any of the, but they, there was no place for them in the concert halls. And so they developed the musical tradition of their own people into this 
phenomenal musical entity we call jazz. It's so magnificent that, in fact, it, is, it stands clearly on its own as an equal to classical music. And white musicians you know, want to play it because it's so great. So the fact that it derived, it was created out of disempowerment, out of exclusion, does not mean that it is not in itself intrinsically enormously valuable and creative. And I would say that the kinds of leadership styles that women have had to develop, or disempowered people have to develop, because it's not just women, it's people who are out of power, because they don't have the ability to simply use the weight of their position to impose their will, that they have to build consensus, they have to listen, they have to find common ground, they have to be intuitive, that that is intrinsically valuable. It is not simply something that we would all give up if we could be seen as, as powerful as the empowered group. But it is, in fact, the epitome. And I often think of the relationship between Canada and the United States, that it very much is like a marriage where the United States is the husband and Canada is the wife. Uh, we know all about you. You know nothing about us. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll stop there while I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, she's our next follow. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'm curious, there seems to be a growing gulf between Europe and the United States today, especially you know, in, the, in the early phases after September 11th, we were marching together. Uh, but since then, there's been this sort of separation out. And, and, and we're almost talking different languages. What, what, what's going on here, and how serious is it yeah, um, you made mention of um, the European reaction, the reaction of European countries uh, in the context of NATO to the September 11 events. And um, that made people think for a moment that the happy times of, uh, say, from 45 to the end of the Cold War had uh, returned. In fact, it was, uh, how should I say, um, that it was an interruption of a, of a process of alienation that had already gone on for a while and is very likely to go on in the years immediately ahead. Why is that? Now, uh, first, uh, clearly, uh, because uh, why? For all, for all the lofty talk about uh, common values, shared uh, values and, uh, and shared interests. Yes, shared interests were there uh, as, as long as the common enemy was, uh, was present. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, even the very, the very rationale for NATO became disputable. And it still is. It still is. So that, that, that's one. Then, uh, over, over the decades after 45, uh, Europe has uh, emancipated itself as it should uh, in, uh, in economic terms um, and has the European Union, for all its political deficiencies and defects, is a tremendous success in economic and financial respect and has we has evolved into a real rival economically for the United States. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not implying that I'm happy with that development, but it's a fact. And that, of course, naturally brings about uh, more and more clashes about uh, e and economic things. The, uh, the, the last, uh, the, the latest example, not the last, oh no. The latest example uh, was steel. Uh, the, protectionist measures, as the Europeans see it, taken by the Bush government on steel imports, not only uh, hitting the Europeans, but also others. And that could grow into a steel war. Um, but there is, there is another aspect to it, but I, I'll only mention it, because otherwise I would have the floor for too long a time, and that is um, that uh, the Europeans get more and more annoyed, like others. But the Europeans may have a bigger ego than others. Um, uh, annoyed uh, with uh, American, American propensity to go it alone. 
and maybe, maybe we, we can, can come to that later uh, when it is about use the, the, the necessary and useful, valuable use of soft power, America is failing enormously. Hmm. Enormously. And to, There's so the much that potential that soft power and is used so badly. So the point that Joe Nye has been making in his book is exactly what you would agree yes, with. Yes, sir. <laughs> I think he's read it. I hope. <laughs> doesn't maybe doesn't need to. <laughs> <laughs> President Fergler, I'm I'm, uh, I, I'm curious if you could come back on a couple of points. One on this general issue of, of globalization, as George Soros has outlined, and then secondly, I wanted to ask about another difference in perspective between the United States and Europe, and that is on on the Middle East, because there's clearly a view in Europe that we're too tilted toward Israel and there's a view, growing view in the United States that the Europeans are too tilted toward the Palestinians. And I'd, I'd like to ask you to help us understand those differences in perspective. What I heard with greatest interest the discussion 10 minutes ago. The intention of your government and of your people to find a way to peace is accepted in my country as well. How to find, that's a little bit more difficult. First remark, since we have been young, the interdependence between all nations, between all men, women, has changed. I had to learn in the first school, people as a whole in the world, 2.1 billion of inhabitants. Now my grandchild is coming and says, Grandpapa, we have 6.3 billion of inhabitants. That's a fact. Whenever we have so many in our community, we need a contact. And it has to do with power. We have to find the balances for this power. And power means, in another word, responsibility too. In our families, in affairs, in governments as well. It never belongs to you personally. It's given. When I think of my children, of our children, then it's quite clear that I'm not a kind of head for all what in the heads of our children is just act well. I'm responsible for this period. Same way, now back to your question, in the Near East. For me, it's a human tragedy. When I was in the last Interaction Congress in Japan, a responsible of Jordani was near me. And he told me, do you know that more than 50 millions of refugees are living in my country? Problem of refugees. Why don't we find a place where we are happy, where we can be sure? That's valuable for him, valuable for all of us. But perhaps, and that's what I hope for you and for us, let's be a little bit more creative. There is a diversity in creation which is not yet at the end for this Middle East problem. Look at the map for Gaza. You find it. You can put it here. Look at the West Bank. Once more the map, all is clear. Go back to the Jordan and look at Jericho, and you will have an idea of that what is to be happened with this room. But the third problem will be the essential and the most difficult one, that's Jerusalem, where, just as we know, the Palestinians want to have a capital too. This too is possible, but only if all religions and all three great religions are insiders in this question, not outsiders. If they are genius enough for finding a kind of authority where peace is possible with deep respect to the freedom of religions in this world. Conclusion, I only hope that you don't stop 
this way to peace. It's hard. And I understand so many, many things happened where people on both sides have been disappointed. You mentioned the name of Rabin. I'm still now sad that the period where we had Rabin in Paris, where you came to Oslo, where they were creative in finding new formula for a definitive piece, couldn't be go on, couldn't go on. But nevertheless, no stop at all. And being in a situation of Kain and Abel cannot be a solution for a long a time. I kill, you kill, and, and so on and so on. I hope. And I hope that all who are in the leadership will be creative. For Brief, excuse me. Brief please. question. Brief unrelated question. Was yesterday's election in France a fluke, or should we read something deeper into it? It was a huge upset. You speak of Paris now. What happened in France yesterday with the socialists losing and Le Pen getting into the runoff? Well, the first answer would be whenever you put the same question to a young Frenchman or to an old Frenchman, he would say, Paris, c'est la France, la France, c'est l'Europe. <laughs> you see, it's, it's easy. It's easy. It's hmm. a problem de lumière. Mais je comprends fort bien. I beg your pardon. I, I understand that you come to this question. For me, you remember when the Shah disappeared, Paris played a very important role. Now that has disappeared, and they are clear enough in all three positions of the candidates for the presidency, that they are co-responsible in finding a relationship with Tehran valuable of the name peaceful relationship. Fighting alone, they can't. Forgetting that you have as neighbor Afghanistan, yet you have as neighbor Iraq, they will not do it. So I don't know exactly what you mean beside the words in your question. Hmm. Well, I, I, I don't want to, to be detained too long on this, but we have gotten, there's, a, there's an underlying conversation in this country about immigration and, and our borders, losing control of our borders and our demographics are rapidly changing in this country uh, so that you know, blacks are now outnumbered by uh, Hispanics for the first time. Uh, in hundreds of years, a couple hundred years. And the issue becomes whether immigration politics yeah. or anti-immigration politics is taking a nasty turn in Europe. What you see in France, and you have seen it on the weekend with the result for Le Pen, you see it in other European countries too, and in other countries of the world. The problem how to find solutions for immigrants will be one of the most powerful questions and I stated in the book of George Soros too, mentioning where in searching instruments for finding solutions, you have beside the hard solutions, soft possibilities and mixtures between every instrument you can use. My answer would be, it's a difficult situation, but they had the difficult situation coming from the Mediterranean room, don't forget, Algeria, and then and they will have to find a solution which is corresponding to the essential values of their society too. I understand. Thank you, sir. Uh, Prime Minister Fraser, before we go to the floor, uh, a question about your part of the world and globalization as it affects Asia. Uh, at, at least one player there, Japan, uh, China, is coming along spectacularly, uh, and India seems to be catching hold. 
uh, globalization seems to have had very positive impact in much of Asia. It has had a very positive impact. But uh, one has to remember in China that uh, still many things are controlled. And I think they've managed their economy uh, brilliantly in recent years. Uh, they've relaxed many controls. They've encouraged investment. Uh, they've encouraged special development areas. Their annual growth rate is 7 or 8 percent, and it has been for many years. And when the economy is as big as China, as large as China, that's a huge growth increment each year. Um, but it's not globalization as it would be preached in Australia or as it would be preached, as I understand it, in the United States. It's globalization managed effectively. Um, and I think India is in very much the same position. But uh, in some areas of industry now, India is doing brilliantly uh, in computer technology, information technology. They're producing some of the best people, and I'm told the United States tries to seduce some of them here. Oh, we do. We have some of them at the Kennedy School, I'm proud to say. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> we hope they'll stay. The, uh, um, if, so you, it, both uh, uh, Dean Nye and George Soros in their books have written about the, the issue of the, the dominant power, the, George Soros might say, the hegemon, uh, and how, they main, how it maintains power. And both of them, I think, come to the conclusion that there's no, even over the, next, over the horizon, over the next 40 to 50 years, unless the United States totally misplays its hand, which it might, uh, that there is no serious threat arising in Asia, as some were arguing, have been arguing about Japan and China over the last 10 years. There's no serious threat to sort of destabilize world power that you see coming in that part of the world. That's what they... There's one, uh, one danger I see in Asia, uh, and it's not in the Korean Peninsula. I, I believe that issue is manageable. Uh, but um, in relation to Taiwan, I think the United States should encourage Taiwan to negotiate realistically and sensibly for reunification. Uh, we sometimes, the newspapers always say Taiwan, which China claims to be part of China, but they forget that every country that has exchanged diplomatic recognition with China has accepted that there is only one China, and Taiwan is part of that China. Now, there are tendencies towards independence. If those were encouraged, and if America supports independence, that undoubtedly would be war of some kind between China and the United States. And I think that is an absolute disaster for our part of the world. And I think it's totally unnecessarily. And um, if Dean and I was managing foreign policy, I'm sure he'd find a way through it and uh -huh. uh, avoid it. All right. Because I, I like what uh, he said about the Middle East. Uh -huh. What, uh, if you have a question, there are microphones here, here, and here. And as you're uh, coming, if you want to ask a question, uh, Joe, did you have a comment on what you've been hearing here? No, I, <clears throat> I think the, just to pick up on uh, uh, Prime Minister Fraser's last comment, uh, I think the situation in, with China is a manageable situation. The grave danger I see is the people who are predicting an inevitable conflict between the U.S. and China. Uh, that need not be, and I think you're right that the the single most neuralgic point in that relationship is the Taiwan issue, and it requires us to handle that very carefully. But the uh, people who are saying that it's inevitable that there'll be a challenge from China which will lead to a war between the United States and China, I think, are profoundly mistaken. Not not a challenge to America's position in the world. I don't think that's on China's agenda. Right. Do you have any follow-up? <coughs> yeah, well, uh, I made the, uh, I did the very unusual thing of actually reading the Republican uh, foreign policy platform uh -huh. at the time of the, ele <coughs> uh, the election. I'd never done that before. It's, it's worth uh, doing. Uh, well, it was because it made it very clear that the, uh, the Bush administration came into power with a hankering after the Cold War. It, it, you know, this was a, a glorious period of, 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 of uh, U.S. Uh, history where the United States was one of the superpowers and the leader of the free world. And the rest of the world was very happy to, to be under the leadership of the United States because there was an enemy 
that they really wanted the protection uh, from. So uh, they were looking for an enemy. Um, um, they didn't like anything to do with international cooperation. NATO was no longer, a, it became a, multi a multinational organization, didn't have the appeal that it had during the, the um, uh, uh, Cold War, and uh, it wanted to reestablish sort of unilateral dominance through missile defense. So first found North, North Korea as a possible uh, you know, uh, uh, placeholder for an enemy. But then we were kind of nurturing along China, and we were even considering uh, Russia. Now, uh, the, the uh, September 11 uh, really relieved the, the administration of having to look for an enemy. We, we found a perfect enemy. <laughs> and it's, uh, since it's invisible, it's going to last us for a long uh, time. <laughs> now, well, this, uh, <laughs> you, he writes about terrorism is the ideal enemy because it is invisible and therefore does not disappear. Having an enemy that poses a genuine and widely recognized threat can be very effective in holding the nation together. That is particularly useful when the prevailing ideology is based on the unabashed pursuit of self-interest. Yeah. That's truly what you believe. Yeah, that is what I said, and that's I said it because I yep. believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're nothing if not provocative. <laughs> I, I really, no, I'm really worried about oh, about uh, <laughs> what our policy, and and I'm worried. I'm, you know, I'm obviously opposed. Uh, to the Bush administration's policies. But I'm very worried because there isn't an alternative vision in this country. I don't see the leadership that is offering the people a, an alternative uh, uh, leadership. And so I, I'm, I think we need that alternative uh, vision because without it, uh, I think we are the greatest enemies now of, of uh, peace in the world. I'm sorry to say that, but we are so powerful that our policies affect the, what happens in the world to such an extent. We can call the shots. We, we set the rules of the game. And unless we change our vision, since uh, uh, mankind's uh, control over, the, the, over, over nature is increasing with, through science and, 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 and uh, technology. And unless we find a better way to, uh, for governance in, in the world, our civilization will destroy itself. Yep. If you can, sir, if you can wait one moment, I, just, I have to, do you have a response to that? Well, I, I, uh, maybe we found another area where George and I can disagree. Uh, I should share his view about the need for a vision, but I take the terrorist threat uh, very seriously. I think what's happening, and I try to argue this in my book, is that technology is putting into the hands of deviant individuals and groups capacities to wreak destruction that have never been held by individuals before. They've been held by governments. If you wanted to kill millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people in the 20th century, you had to be a Hitler or a Stalin or a Mao and have the apparatus of government to do it. It's not out of the question that within 10 years, deviant individuals and groups will have that destructive power. So I think the, uh, I think the war on terrorism may, whether that's the right term for it or not, but I think the terrorist threat is absolutely critical if you had a World Trade Center event, or several of them, and if it was carried out by weapons of mass destruction, it might totally change the nature of our urban civilization. Uh, we, wouldn't, we, would, we would survive, but what we, the art museums, the, the theaters, the music halls, the, what would happen to urban real estate? I mean, the idea that we would allow this to happen to our civilization, I think, is a tremendous threat. So, I do take the, the uh, terrorist threat very seriously because I think the technological trends are, are uh, pushing us in a direction which is indeed more threatening than the Cold War. 
Let, let me, if, if I might yeah. just say, uh, I agree with you about the terrorist threat. That's why I think Saddam is, is a serious threat mm -hmm. that we ought to uh, deal with. I think we are dealing with it with, with, with the wrong way. I think waging war on, on terrorism is the wrong metaphor that, that we are applying. We must defend ourselves against uh, terrorism. But we must also address the, the, the iniquities and the grievances that, on which terrorism feeds. Without that, that the, the, the terrorists would have very, they, they could kill some people, but they wouldn't have that much influence. So we must have a two-pronged approach, and we are forgetting about the second, uh, second leg. That's, so I don't think we are in disagreement. Okay, on that let's, one. let's go to the floor. Uh, standard rules. Uh, one question per customer. Brief. Please state your name. And as the dean would say, each question should end with a question mark. Please. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your um, for the discussion. It was very very interesting. Following up on the aspect of moral responsibility. Your name. I am I'm Xantinos Papazoglu. I'm an MPP one. I'm from Greece. Uh, one issue of following up the moral responsibility, as the, the Canadian Prime Minister mentioned. Um, coming from Europe, I would say that one thing that the Europeans can understand is the lack of consistency that characterizes the US foreign policy. And to illustrate that, I, I, I want to give an example. For example, we have UN resolutions, and we have different approaches on behalf of the US foreign policy. We have the UN resolution in 1991, and the, the US troops went to, to Kuwait and liberate the country from the Iraqi troops. But we have UN resolutions for the removal of the Turkish troops from Cyprus and the removal of the Israeli troops from Palestine. And indeed, this time the United States is, not, is reluctant to intervene militarily and enforce the UN resolutions. So my question is, don't you think, or what is the, the response um, to, that, to, this, um, to this belief that there is in Europe, that the main problem of the US foreign policy is the lack of consistency? Thank you. I think that's directed that, at you. Do I get that one? <laughs> uh, I think the fact that we have not solved uh, the Cyprus problem or the Middle East problem is an indication of what I argue in my book, which is we're not as powerful as we think we are. Uh, people often talk about the American empire. I think that's profoundly misleading. I actually lived in the uh, uh, remnants of the British empire when I was doing my doctoral work. And let me tell you, it meant that uh, the school curriculum, the who got into what buildings, uh, the laws, all this was controlled by people outside of Uganda where I was living. Uh, there's no way in the world today that the Americans have that kind of control. And there are ways to resist. Uh, even if you just take the relations of the United States and Europe, uh, when the US wants to reach a trade agreement, it can't do it without the permission of Pascal Lamy and the European Commission. Uh, if the US, if Jack Welch wants to merge GE and Honeywell, he gets the American Justice Department to approve that of merger of two American companies. And guess what? He couldn't do it because the European Commission didn't agree. So there's a great illusion to think there's an American empire. Uh, the idea that we could suddenly remove those Turkish troops or remove, uh, uh, push Sharon to remove his troops more quickly when he was involved in a counter-terrorist attack, I think is an illusion. We are not as powerful as we think we are. Richard. Yeah, I'm Richard Sobel. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an admirer of both of the books and the gentleman and lady on the, the platform. There was a fascinating discussion of globalization at the law school, the Sen Summers discussion. Both of you presented important aspects of globalization. But I think there's, to a certain extent, a dialogue of the deaf going on. When I hear opponents of globalization, they argue in one direction. When I hear people who, who look at the positive aspects of it. So I'd ask Dean Nye and Mr. Soros and other people on the panel, can you take one of the arguments about the problems with globalization and argue in ways that you feel would be persuasive to people about what, what the benefits of globalization are for answering some of the problems such as poverty? Uh, inequality around the world? Um, I think a very narrow definition of globalization. That's globalization of financial markets. Now, that's a relatively recent phenomenon. I date it to, let's say, 1980 with Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. 
And the effect of, of that globalization is to allow capital to move freely. Uh, it cannot be taxed or regulated as easily as it could be if it weren't so free to move around. Now, that brings great benefits. And I think one should recognize them. Because, because uh, it, um, private enterprise is very good at wealth creation. And states are very bad at it. So getting the states out of the economy is, is a great benefit. It also brings, it, it liberates entrepreneurial uh, um, uh, energies, in invention, uh, technological advances. I, I think that, you know, uh, internet and, and, and uh, telecommunications boom, bust, is not unrelated to globalization. So those are the benefits. In, in other words, that you've got more wealth. Now, what markets are not good at is in providing public goods in the, in the broadest uh, sense. Um, uh, things that are collective needs. They're good at looking after individual needs and allocating resources with, among them. But when they, uh, the, there are collective needs, in, uh, maintaining markets is actually a collective need. And markets are not very good at that. If you left it to, to free enterprise, there would be um, monopolies all over, Microsoft, mi Microsoft written, uh, you know, uh, multiplied many times. So uh, this is a lopsided uh, uh, situation. We, you know, there's a, a difference between private wealth creation and the creation of public goods. And we need to correct that. So globalization is actually, a, 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 I think, uh, uh, has great potential and it has great weaknesses. Does that answer your question? Well, if, if someone who was an opponent or, or concerned about the detrimental aspects of globalization were to bring this up and to point to the inequalities that the market globalization had, this is where I'm asking you to speak to their language of, of either how to deal with those inequalities or how in some way those inequalities in the long run will benefit them. This is what I mean by speaking in terms of a dialogue as opposed to in terms of advocacy or uh, opposition. Kim? Well, it's interesting. I see Malcolm Fraser. We're both from, from different countries that have a different approach to these issues. One of the interesting things about the United States is that there is, there is this American exceptionalism and this kind of very elaborate, way, this, this prevalence of market fundamentalism. You know, the, the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was the issue that brought me into national politics in Canada, because I really believe very strongly that the Free Trade Agreement would make us more productive economically. Uh, and it has. I mean, the trade between our two countries, is, which is incidentally the largest bilateral trading relationship in the world, has more than doubled since that agreement went into force in 1989. But I never for a moment assumed that that was the panacea for all problems. And it's interesting because countries like Canada, and I think Australia and others, European countries, have a very clear sense. We've learned that, the mar that governments are not good creators of wealth. The governments are not good at picking economic winners. That the force of wealth creation is inchoate, and governments need to create the setting in which people can create wealth, but the old days when we thought we could have command economies, I mean, we've gotten over that now. We don't believe that. But there are still enormously important ways in which, as a community, we need to use governments. And countries like Canada find this very comfortable. We have a public health care system. And for all of its problems, uh, although, again, living in the United States, you see, I mean, I lived in California when people hated the HMOs. I mean, any system where you have somebody other than the individual patient paying for his or her own health care is going to have tensions over cost control, et cetera. But in Canada, notwithstanding the difficulties, well over 90% of Canadians think it's unthinkable to have a system where anybody could be impoverished by catastrophic illness. European countries are even more generous than the Canadians are in terms of programs for children. French school children are, are, have access to public schooling at the time of their three years old. So what I'm saying is that just because you believe in markets, just because you think the globalization of financial markets and the opportunities for trade is a good thing, doesn't mean that you want to pack up the capacity of a democratic society to solve other problems collectively. And I think the, what I've seen over my own adult lifetime is a swing in the United States away from the philosophy of the great society and the notion that there was a collective responsibility to try and uh, level the playing field to this notion that governments can never do anything right. And I think that, that that's a problem. And I think, again, it undermines America's soft power. 
because I think it creates a morality, a, a cruel set of values that underlies a lot of American policies that, that seems to be um, you know, it, not, not cognizant of those other, other needs, the concerns about labor standards, the concerns about the environment, the concerns about child welfare. Now, this is a huge country, and there are many people in this country who are, in fact, extremely uh, concerned about those issues. But official policy appears to, to take a view of globalization, which feeds into those uh, who, who are afraid of it. Malcolm Frazier. Um, I, I can't answer the question in the terms you want, because I think globalization as currently practiced is unsustainable. The heads of global corporations will be in the United States, in Europe, um, in Japan, in China, and I would suspect nowhere else. Um, and uh, that, that's not a world. Um, the world won't accept that kind of economic organization. The, uh, certainly, it's a great wealth creator. But even within countries, the division between uh, the well-off and the poor has grown markedly since globalization, and it is a direct consequence of globalization. In the wider world, you've got 50 countries that can't even tap into any element of globalization. They're not on the internet, and their kids don't learn to use computers at schools because they can't afford them. It would be within our capacity, within a, an aid program as we used to provide it 30 years ago, because we all spent more money on it then. Um, of making sure that every child in every third world school could queue into the internet. We don't even take the first step in thinking that's a good idea. So I, I, I think there, there's a lot that needs to be done. If you, if you wanted to establish a more equitable system, yeah. the, most, the single most important step would be to provide free and open trade for third world countries. Yes, that's it, that's it. And that would do more than all the development assistance in the world and it would give people dignity and self-esteem because they could earn their own way forward. Um, but we don't do that in, uh, in Europe, in this country, in Japan. Agriculture, which is the product these people want to sell, is so heavily protected that they can't get adequate access to the markets. And, you know, there are absurdities in, in Africa. Africa buys more meat from Europe than it is allowed to sell to Europe. And you can take the absurdities right down the line on, on agricultural markets. Free trade is great, but let it be free trade in all things, not just in high technology goods. Hi, my name is Nathan Smith. I'm an MPAID one. Uh, my question was, first of all, for Prime Minister Fraser, but um, if other people on the panel want to address it, I'd, I'd be interested in that as well. It's about the, the issue of Taiwan. Um, I find, I, I've heard a lot of statesmen and sometimes journalists expressing opinions that Taiwan should eventually reunify with China and opposing its sort of quasi-independence. And I actually find it really quite confusing. Um, the, you mentioned that the press always says Taiwan, which China claims is a part of it. I think this reflects, I mean, the fact that Taiwan's been separate from China for almost the whole 20th century, the fact that, I mean, it's now a democracy and that values of democracy and self-determination are sufficiently established that it's very hard for us to actually picture um, a country, a democratic country being subordinated to an authoritarian state against its will. Um, and so this is usually treated with some derision by the press, but um, but you've expressed support for reunification and opposition to this quasi-independent. I mean, I assume you don't actually think that you're just sacrificing a country of 22 million people to, on the altar of peace, but I'd like for you to maybe give some idea of what kind of principles actually differentiate your position from that. Well, uh, the two parts of the question. You can't look at this issue and do it merely from Western eyes. You've got to understand history, and you've got to understand that China has been humiliated by Western powers uh, a long time ago, but they remember it, and they're not going to let it happen ever again. 
In 1904, um, Japan took Taiwan from China by force by, and, a, and a military defeat for China. But in 1900, uh, because uh, trading concessions weren't going the way uh, Western powers wanted, four major Western powers marched into Beijing and imposed their will on China and got the trading concessions that they thought that they deserved, but which they were able to take simply because of their superior power. Through history, China has, in a sense, vacillated. When they've had strong governments in Beijing, it's been a unified territory. When they've had weak governments in Beijing, and it's a huge territory, there have been wars and uh, divisions, and the provinces have had a much greater degree of freedom. But in its relationship with Western powers, China is a proud nation, an ancient nation. They were as they believe, a civilized country long before any of us were, um, certainly Caucasians from Australia or, or whatever. Um, well, I wasn't <laughs> wanting to speak for everyone else here. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and, and they are not going to be humiliated by the United States, by Britain, by France, by Germany, by Europe, ever again. And if you want to do it, you'll have a war. That's one simple fact of life with China. Now, Taiwan, uh, through its history, has been part of China. And uh, from Nixon to Clinton, every president has accepted that it was part of China, but it should be reunified peacefully and not by military means. That means there's an obligation on Taiwan to negotiate. And I believe an obligation on the United States not to be saying, oh, we'll defend Taiwan whatever it takes, but to say also, but you have to negotiate for reunification because as so long as you do that, there's not going to be any conflict. Now, Hong Kong has been highly successful since reunification. Taiwan would gain even more lenient conditions. It would, in my view, keep its parliament, it would keep its police, it would keep its corporate laws, it would keep its own military. And it would, the only thing it would give up is the claim to representation in international organizations for which statehood is a requirement. Is it realistic to believe, Joe, that uh, the United States government would encourage, seriously encourage or push Taiwan toward negotiations? Well, the key question on this is timetables. If you try to get a negotiation of this issue in the short run, in a year or two, uh, it's not going to happen because the differences between China and Taiwan are too great. But if you look out uh, 10 years, 20 years, and you imagine change in, in China continuing to occur with increased pluralization, uh, the proposal that you could have a Taiwan-China relationship, which you could preserve democracy and freedom in Taiwan uh, in some sort of special arrangement, um, which still recognize Taiwan as part of China, it's not out of the question. And the, uh, I think the key thing is to make clear that uh, the US policy is we do not accept the use of force, but we do not accept Taiwan be being it recognized as an independent uh, country either. And that within that set of parameters, we should be encouraging discussion, trade back and forth, uh, more exchange peoples, and I think that it's possible over time that you ha can have a peaceful resolution. Could, could I add a, add a footnote? Um, Taiwan business people are betting that it's going to happen. They've already got $60 billion worth of their own investment on the mainland. Yeah. They're not going to do that and think they're going to lose it in the war. 50,000 Taiwanese firms in Shanghai. <laughs> yeah. We have time for two more questions. Yes, sir? And then we'll have this, and I'm afraid that we're going to have to call it to an end. Please. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Chang. Uh, I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I have a question about information technology and moral leadership uh, addressed to Mr. Soros. But before I ask that question, I'd like to preface it with a trivia question for the panelists. Um, I have a niece and, niece and nephew who are growing up in the digital age, and they are playing with uh, moving toys, uh, Lego blocks that move. The trivia question being, if you take six of these Lego blocks with eight studs on them, how many different combinations can you make? 
<laughs> Six, eight studded Lego blocks. He, he actually has, has deals with money in much the same way. You realize that. So. <laughs> 48 factorial. <laughs> it's over 103 million combinations. That's probably 48 factorial. Yeah. It's pro yeah. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> the technical question, of course, for Mr. Soros being, the kids can take the Lego blocks and make whatever they wish. They can make a toy gun, or they can make a windmill. How do we influence children to use technology constructively as opposed to destructively? And I, ask, I single you out, Mr. Soros, because I was recently in Russia. I saw many of your 33 internet centers, and it was amazing. Um, it was like finding a UFO in the forest sometime. Well, we are actually, foundations are trying to do, ex do exactly that uh, by, um, we have a program called Step by Step, which is kind of modeled after Head Start, and which we have introduced in every country where we have a foundation. foundation. And it's, uh, it's a, a kind of child-centered uh, education. That is to say, enable the children to develop instead of uh, uh, indoctrinating them uh, the way it used to be uh, under under communism, and uh, we do a number of uh, things. There's a, a, a network called uh, IEARN, it's, uh, which is uh, projects that the children uh, participate in throughout the world. And I visited the Gobi Desert and the children are participating in that uh, program. So, you know, it's, uh, it's something that is an ongoing uh, effort, uh, and I think it's basically very promising. How do we keep, then, people from using sophisticated technology how, how do to you... crash sophisticated technology to crash an airplane into a building as opposed to inventing something much more constructive for society? Well, you, you, you know, you, you can't stop uh, uh, some deviations. It, it's, uh, you give people technology, they can use it any uh, way they, they, they like. So it's not just a question of giving uh, children technology, uh, but also uh, sort of uh, um, bringing them into in, into the, uh, an open society, uh, and um, you know you win some, you lose some, but on the whole, it's it, that is a winning game. I mean, that is making the world a better place. Final question, sir. Hi, um, my name is Benjamin Bolger, and I'm a graduate student at the School of Design. And what my question is, is that the uh, overwhelming amount of urbanization that's occurred in this uh, century has certainly been connected in many ways to globalization. And we've heard a lot of negative consequences of urbanization. But I guess the two-point question of what are some positive or creative benefits to urbanization? And do, do anyone uh, on the panel suspect that there will be a tipping point where either because of security concerns of terrorism or environmental concerns that will reach a tipping point that will reduce the for forces of urbanism and, and you know, see a much more kind of greener, more broad acre type of society? So th that's the two questions. In fact, I think there's a lot of argument to be made that urbanization is environmentally friendlier, uh, that there are ways of getting critical mass and uh, better use of energy resources and others. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't see that that is, as a conflict. Intelligent urbanization can, in fact, be very kind to the planet. I, I was specifically looking for, like, a, a democratic, political or democratic uh, effect of urbanization, if, if that's a positive. That's people talk to each other face to face. Is that a commonly shared view on this panel, that urbanization is actually uh, environmentally friendly? It's, it's hard to imagine how you could accommodate all the people in the world. Uh, without them l living mm. living uh, in uh, uh, conurbations, it, mm -hmm. it's. Uh, I mean, uh, so I, I think there is a mm -hmm. there is a point to it. Hmm. 
because yeah. one reads all these scary stories about, you know, 20, 30 million people are going to be living in these 20 cities, and there's going to be, people are going to be just strangling there, and it's no, it, 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 Mexico it, City. And, it's not an and, argument and, for and, unlimited population growth. I mean, I think just in right. general, the, that the world can probably, there are probably optimal sizes of population for the world. No, and, and of course, the, uh, that is a, a, a very uh, a big problem, uh, the, the rapid growth of, of, uh, of uh, urban centers without um, public services, without water, without sanitation, and, and so on. On the other hand, the concern is that the, the threat of terrorism and the vulnerability of urban centers may you know, uh, affect people's views of them, but again, I don't think there's enough wilderness for everybody to go out and have their own little, you know, 20-acre plot either. But, uh, I, 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 in talking to people who've just been back, coming back from China, that they, they say there's been this explosion. You, your Shanghai and uh, and Beijing are just taking off economically, but they're really worried about the environmental impacts mm -hmm. there. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Malcolm Fraser, whether you, you, you share this view. There are environmental problems in China, and I think they were late starting to handle it. But um, last time I was in Beijing, the environment was much better than it had been the time before. Still a fair way to go. But I believe the, the Chinese are taking environmental issues uh, seriously and that they're acting on them. John I, final word? Well, just uh, it, uh, it depends on what kind of urbanization. I mean, if you look at China, the yellow dust which is invading Korea is not coming from urban areas, it's coming from the Gobi Desert and the desertification. And people in poor parts of China want to go to Beijing, and, Beijing, and the Chinese government is trying to keep them out of Beijing. If something's so wrong in the urban area, why do people want to go there? I think that Actually, in China, it's interesting that um, ecological awareness is actually quite high, both, both in the government, and it's the one area where civil society can actually mm -hmm. organize itself. So people who used to be involved in my foundation in China now have uh, ecological foundations. <laughs> you know, there's a woman uh, who is now who was uh, campaigning against the Three Gorges. Mm -hmm. There's another organization which is very effective uh, that is concerned with, with ecological um, uh, issues. It's, hmm. uh, it's a good point. Prime Minister Van Eyck? Yeah, what I've found exciting about the question was you're referring to your con obvious concern, your apparent concern about the environment. Uh, one thing, and now uh, uh, aside from urbanization, the best, uh, one of the best contributions the United States could uh, do to the environment, best service that I can think of at this juncture is accept the Kyoto Protocols. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, this has been a, both a wide-ranging and a provocative conversation. I, I, I never thought I'd hear some of the things I heard tonight said from this stage. Uh, but that only uh, indicates the, uh, uh, the breadth and depth of uh, conversation that comes through to the Kennedy School. Again, we're so thankful to those of you from the Interactive Council, to those of you from the Dean's Council uh, who are here. And I want to thank our, our uh, uh, President Fergler, uh, uh, Prime Minister F uh, uh, Fraser, of course our Dean, and, and Prime Minister Van Act, and, and, and Prime Minister Campbell, uh, and George Soros uh, for joining us here tonight. Thank Let's join <laughs> Thank you too. Thank you too. Thank you too. Well, well done. That was so hard. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you're going to continue. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good.